There's so much that God is up to here at Chapel Street, but there are just a few things that we wanted to share with you. First, we'll be celebrating baptisms in our services on Sunday, September 8th. Baptism is an important moment in the life of every follower of Jesus, an outward symbol of an inward change, a chance to proclaim to your church family about the faith that you have put in Christ and the new life that is found only in Him. If you're ready to take this step, we'd love to celebrate with you. For more information, you can visit chapelstreet.church slash baptism. Here at Chapel Street, one of the things we like to say is that we are a place for where you are. In other words, that no matter where you're at today, if things are going great and everything is up and to the right, or if this has been a difficult season, there is a place for you. With that in mind, we have a variety of care and support groups that are starting up soon. We have groups for divorce care, sexual integrity, personal development, grief share, and addiction and recovery. Our hope is that no one that calls this place home feels like they have to go through life alone. Learn more at chapelstreet.church care. Well, God's been so faithful to our church over this past year, and one of the ways that we build in time to reflect on what he has done is through our annual meeting coming up on Saturday, September 14th at 6.30 p.m. This is an opportunity to look back at God's goodness, to look forward to what's ahead, and for members of our church to participate by voting on issues regarding our church's leadership and budget for our new ministry year. All are welcome, and for those of us who are members, your presence and your vote are vital. Finally, we're just a few weeks away from this Falls Rooted session launching on Sunday, September 8th. Hundreds of Chapel Streeters have gone through this study and have found meaningful connection to God, their purpose, and their church family. No matter how long you've been part of our church or where you're at in your faith journey, I believe that Rooted has something to say to you. Check out Steve and Allison's story to see why. My name's Steve Sanchez. Uh, Me and my wife Allison have been going to Chapel Street now for probably a little over two and a half years. It's funny how Rooted started for us. It was one of those things where we would we'd be watching the video. And hey, Chapel Street Church. We'd look at each other and we'd be like, we should do that. And then we'd look back and then we just wouldn't do it. <laughs> Being a Christian isn't a spectator sport. You can't just go every Sunday. I've done it before. I've gone every Sunday and I've sat there and I've got in the car and I've gone home and I've waited six days and I went back. <laughs> We felt like the most important way and the best way for us to, to get closer to God and to get farther in our, in our faith walk was to get plugged in and to actually start doing things. So that's what we decided to do. I had never been in Bible studies. I had never done really anything outside of just going to church. So the whole me not knowing a ton of like scripture or me not having the answers to certain things was a little stressful, a little frightening. But the thing that I love about Rooted is it's it's so cheesy to say it, but Chapel Street is for where you are and the people in Rooted, it's just for where they are. Father, thank you again for bringing us together. We had people who had been leaders, they led Bible studies and stuff like this for their whole life. And we had people who were like me and Allison, who, you know, we were in our faith for a couple of years, knew some stuff, but didn't know a lot of stuff. We had people who were brand new and and had brand new questions. That diversity was very inviting. I definitely think my prayer life has been more intentional through Rooted, uh, really understanding the concept of quiet time and clearing out the noise. The way I've seen it change in your life is it's it's become less of a last resort and more of a first step for you. I feel like it's allowed me to be more comfortable too when you can kind of sense that someone has something going on and just asking if you could pray over them or pray for them or how can I add you to my prayer list. So lately in our life, God really honestly has been teaching us patience and and faith my wife she was diagnosed with uh, sarcoma so it was hard to hear she had a she had a tumor in her arm that was removed that they thought was benign it ended up not being so she had to go up on radiation everyone was so vulnerable and so honest in our group that when we ended up having to fight this battle with cancer with allison we had so much hope because we heard everyone else's testimony and we saw what God had done in their lives. 
and we just knew that God would get us through this in our lives also. And so to have that, to have those examples and to have those people also praying with you and that support system there, it made it a lot easier to get through. We know that God put the people in our group, in our group for a reason. And we, we know that the testimonies that were shared in our group were testimonies that will help us in our life, that we can always go back to. And they're testimonies that we can look at and we can say they went through something similar and they came out completely fine. I didn't expect at all to be as close with the members of our root group as I was. I love these people. They are the people who would do anything to get me closer to Christ. To get that from Rooted was like, I mean, that's just icing on the cake, you know what I mean? Like, I went into it knowing that I was going to grow in my faith, but I didn't go into it expecting that I was going to have these lifelong friends encourage me to grow in my faith. And that was, that was really, that was really, really cool. last hour. It's not cheesy at all to say that Chapel Street is for where you are. Uh, and in case you're wondering, what that means is we're all in different places in our spiritual journeys. As, some of, as he said, some of us are brand new to this. Others of you have been in the church for a long time. All of us need Christ, need to grow deeper in the knowledge of his love. Uh, and we're, the church is for that purpose, to help you wherever you are, to take the next step in understanding who Christ is, who, what your identity is in him and how to grow in faith. And so Rooted is launching, life groups are launching, and maybe you're sitting here going, I need that. Well, don't, don't be the person who says, I need that and doesn't do anything about it. Maybe this is the moment you, you sign up and you take advantage of that. We hope you do. Let's pray and before we jump into God's word this morning. Father, thank you for the way that you love us. We've been singing about the power of your name and the glory of your presence and what you've done for us. And now we come to your word. Your word cuts through all the other words, speaks with clarity to our situation, to who we are. And so speak to us, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. If you were jumping in for the first time, or maybe you've been with us, you know we're in a series uh, called What is the Church? Four parts on the heart, the identity and purpose of God's people in the world. And we're, we're, what we're doing here is we're trying to combat a lot of the misconceptions in our culture, and frankly, even in our own congregation, church family, about what the church is. What is it we're doing when we come together uh, and attend this thing we call the church? Is it a building? Is it a service? Is it programs? Uh, what does God's word have to say about our identity and purpose as his people, his church. Looking at four metaphors from the New Testament. Last week was the body of Christ. This week we're looking at a very different one. I'll get to that in a minute. But um, you know, if you, within five miles of where we're gathered right now, drive up Randall Road North or South or head East or West, there are over 40, I did a little quick search, over 40 churches, 40 Christian churches within five miles of us, probably more, but 40 that I was counting. Roman Catholic, Protestant, Episcopal, Methodist, uh, Presbyterian, Baptist, non-denominational, you name it. All kinds of different denominations and worship styles, and, but they're all churches. And that's not a bad thing, but I want you to know that's a pretty recent thing in church history. The idea that you could drive up and down a road and pick and choose a church to attend that would fit your family's spiritual needs, is a, is, I'm not saying that's a bad thing, but it's new. Like for most of church history, that was not an option. The church was the people that belonged to Jesus in that region gathered together. There weren't, there was just them. There wasn't a whole bunch of them to choose from. And what I think one of the things that my observation is that happens, that has happened for us is it creates a bit of a religious marketplace in our culture. A little bit of a, you know, we, we use the phrase church shopping, but you, you can do that. And what can happen is churches start to see themselves as vendors of a service and attenders start to see themselves as like we're consumers and we're evaluating that way and that begins to happen. It happens on both sides of the equation. That's not at all what the New Testament means when it talks about the church. It's not a product to be consumed. Um, Philip Reif wrote a book called The Triumph of the Therapeutic. Um, and and, and he, uh, has a, he talks, here's what he says about what church used to mean um, in, in, in previous generations. He says, formerly, if men were miserable, they went to church in order, in order to find the rationale and cure for their misery. You're struggling in life. You feel like you're missing something. It's not going well. You don't feel like, you're, it's something, like life isn't right. I don't understand why I feel this way. What's wrong with me? I would go to church to understand my condition. And what does God have to say about it? 
He writes this, they did not expect to be or be made to feel happy. That idea is Greek, not Christian or Jewish. Okay, so in other words, men and women would go to church to understand their, their condition, their deep need not to be made to feel happy. Now, Carl Truman, I know this is like, I, I, we're geeking out a bit here. Carl Truman wrote a book called The Rise and Triumph of the Modern Self. It's a fascinating read. I recommend it to you. Um, and here's what he writes about Reef's quote that I just read to you. Here's what he says. Such a notion is incomprehensible today. We as Christians intuitively go to church to feel good, perhaps to meet friends or to sing uplifting songs, whether traditional or contemporary, or to have our minds stimulated by a good sermon, our ears edified by beautiful music. Prayers, personal and corporate, tend to focus on the alleviation of misery, not on being enabled to understand it. We tend to go to, to choose the church that fits with what makes us personally feel good. I think he's right. Now, let me be clear. We believe the gospel of Jesus Christ is really good news. The best news the world has ever heard. It's good news. It does speak to our condition. It does give us hope, and that should make us feel good. We also believe the church is in the world to make an impact, to meet needs, real needs, material, physical needs of people in the world. But that doesn't mean the church is reduced to a, an institution that just meets the felt needs of the people in the community, which is how we start to think about it if we're not careful. Our series, What is the Church, then is getting at the heart of our identity and purpose as God's people, looking at these images. And today we look at the image of the bride, the church as the bride of Christ. For a number of reasons, this is a challenging image. I've wrestled with this all week to reduce it down to one sermon, to get my head around the depth and richness of this image as a man to get inside and understand what does that mean that I'm part of the bride of Christ. And to help you with this image, I'm gonna give you another image on the screen. Come on. Yeah. That's 31 years ago. And if you know my wife, she looks the same. She looks the same. I don't. <laughs> we, we had no idea what we were doing. But praise God for his faithfulness over 31 years. Um, that we're, we're the bride of Christ. Now, it might sound strange to some of you. The church is the bride. But I really want you to hear this. Once you begin to grasp what the scriptures are teaching from the, almost the beginning to the end, all throughout, Old and New Testament, it's one of the richest and deepest images and most important for us that we could possibly understand. So I want to take a moment and just read to you just a, just a, a, a small sampling of the Old and New Testament passages that speak to God's love for his people as a bridegroom loves his bride. Isaiah 54, 5. Your maker is your husband. The Lord of hosts is his name. And the Holy One of Israel is your redeemer. The God of the whole earth he is called. Isaiah 61, 10. I will greatly rejoice in the Lord. My soul shall exult in my God, for he has clothed me with the garments of salvation. He has covered me with the robe of righteousness. As a bridegroom decks himself like a priest with a beautiful headdress, and as a bride adorns herself with her jewels. And Isaiah 62, verses 3 through 5. You shall be a crown of beauty in the hand of the Lord and a royal diadem in the hand of your God. You shall no more be termed forsaken, and your land shall no more be termed desolate, but you shall be called, my delight is in her, and your land married. For the Lord delights in you, and your land shall be married. For as a young man marries a young woman, so shall your sons marry you, as the bridegroom rejoices over the bride. So shall your God rejoice over you. Now jump ahead to the New Testament, Ephesians chapter 5. This is a passage that we've often taught here about God's vision for human marriage as the covenant relationship between one man and one woman for life. That's God's invention. We're not free to reinvent it. It's his beautiful picture of what marriage is. But in that same passage, Paul is also even primarily talking about God's love for the church, his people. Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her that he might sanctify her having cleansed her by the washing of water with the word, so that he might present the church to himself in splendor, without spot or wrinkle or any such thing, that she might be holy and without blemish. In the same way, husbands should love their wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself. 
And then we jump to the very last book of the Bible, just a couple more, Revelation chapter 19, verses 6 through 9, talking about how all of history comes to its culmination. Then I heard what seemed to be the voice of a great multitude, like the roar of many waters, like the sound of mighty peals of thunder, crying out, Hallelujah! For the Lord our God, the Almighty reigns. Let us rejoice and exult and give him glory. Why? For the marriage of the Lamb has come, and his bride has made herself ready. It was granted her to clothe herself with fine linen, bright and pure, for the fine linen is the righteous deeds of the saints. And the angel said to me, write this, blessed are those who are invited to the marriage supper of the Lamb. And he said to me, these are the true words of God. And then again in Revelation chapter 21, verses one and two, then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away and the sea was no more. And I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. We could, we could spend the entire time we have just reading passages from the Bible that talk about God's love for his people as a groom loves his bride. Now, I know this is challenging. It is for me. For one reason, half the room, well, maybe less than half, but a portion of the room is men. And men aren't brides, so how do we understand what this means to us? Some of you are single and you long to be married, but you've never been married, so what does it mean for you to think of yourself as the bride of Christ? Some of you are divorced in here or widowed and there's pain associated with the marriage image and it gets in your way of understanding what God is saying. And all of us live in a culture where marriage has been twisted out of shape in a thousand ways and distorted, and that can cloud our vision to what God is actually saying. But for all this, it's important that we grasp what this image means, what Christ is saying to us. And the fact that it's challenging for us probably means we have something to learn, something he wants to give us. So what does it mean that the church is the bride of Christ? What does that actually mean? Every unique metaphor given to us about the church is emphasizing some part of our relationship to God, to Jesus. Last week, the body talked about how we belong to him as members of his body and how we relate to one another and the world and in our interdependence on one another. Next week, we'll talk about the building being joined together and established and built on a foundation. All the other images, except for this one, are, have both vertical implications, our relationship to Christ, and horizontal, our relationship to each other. The bride is solely vertical. It's our relationship to Jesus and how he relates to us, how he sees us more specifically. How does he see us? Well, number one, we're chosen and cherished by him. To be the bride of Christ means he's chosen you and he cherishes you. He makes us his bride. What makes you the bride of Christ? He does. He chose you. He cherishes you. Song of Solomon 6 verse 3, I am my beloved's and my beloved is mine. Song of Solomon 7 verse 10, I belong to my beloved and his desire is for me. Galatians chapter 1, verse 15. But when he who set me apart before I was born and who called me by his grace, he chose me. Ephesians 1, 4. Even as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and blameless before him in love. It is an incredibly powerful thing to begin to grasp that the Lord of heaven chose you and cherishes you and calls you his bride. To be honest, sometimes when I think about the history of the church, ancient history and contemporary history, beautiful bride is not the word that comes to my mind. When I think about some of the things Christians have done that aren't so great, that don't look so good, the way we treat each other, infighting, arguing, and the way we sometimes treat those outside the church, I wouldn't call it beautiful. Maybe you can relate to that. But Jesus calls us beautiful. What? That's hard. Like, what makes him, us beautiful then in his eyes? When we, by our own admission, we who are in the church know our flaws and our failures and know that we, we don't measure up to any standard of beauty or goodness. How can the king of kings find the church beautiful? I heard a story about, uh, from jo Johnny Erickson Tata. If you don't know her, she, she's a, a quadriplegic. When she was a young, a teenage girl, she dove into a lake. It was shallow. She uh, struck her head and uh, neck on the bottom and was paralyzed uh, from the neck down. And she's a remarkable woman of faith. 
but she writes about her wedding day as a quadriplegic and her struggle to see herself as a beautiful bride. She's got, she's, she's paralyzed, her, she's got her, her bridesmaids trying to get her into this dress and she just isn't feeling good at all about herself. And here's what she says. No amount of corseting my, and binding my body could give me a perfect shape. The dress just wouldn't fit well. Then as I was wheeling into the church, I glanced down and noticed that I had accidentally run over the hem of my dress, leaving a greasy tire mark and a tear. My paralyzed hands could not hold the bouquet of flowers that lay off center tilted on my lap. And my chair, though decorated for the wedding, was still a big clunky gray metal machine with belts and gears and ball bearings. I certainly did not feel at all like a picture perfect bride in a magazine. As I inched my chair closer to the last pew to catch a glimpse of Ken in front, that's her, her husband, there he was, standing tall and stately in his attire. I saw him looking for me, craning his neck to look up the aisle. My face flushed, and suddenly I just couldn't wait to be with him. I had seen my beloved, and the love in Ken's face washed away all my feelings of unworthiness. I saw his pure, I saw myself that I was his pure and perfect bride. I love that story. Because you look at yourself and you, I look at myself and you see failures and flaws and ugliness, but Christ looks at you. And if you could see the way that he looks at you. I've stood next to lots and lots of grooms on their wedding day as a pastor. And you can feel the, the stage tremble when the bride walks in, you know. You can feel it. They're waiting to see her. And I know what it's like to be on that side. But if we could put ourselves on the side of the bride and know that Jesus is looking at us like that, straining to see us, finding us lovely, what makes us lovely? We aren't. I mean, some of you look better than others, but uh, you know, relatively speaking, but on the whole, we aren't. Here's what C.S. Lewis writes about this in his book, The Four Loves. Uh, it's, it's, it's beautiful. For the church has not beauty, but what the bridegroom gives her. He does not find her, but makes her lovely. As Christ sees in the flawed, proud, fanatical, or lukewarm church on earth, that bride who will one day be without spot or wrinkle and labors to produce the latter. So the husband whose headship is Christ-like and he is allowed no other sort, never despairs. I love the, the idea that we aren't lovely in ourselves, but, and Jesus doesn't look around to find the beautiful ones and choose them. He is love makes us beautiful. We have no beauty or goodness other than what he gives us. And the degree to which we can see ourselves as he sees us begins to change us into something beautiful. What changed, right, for Johnny Erickson Tata? One look from her husband. Theologians call that the beatific vision. It's, it's you know, we, I, we, we talk about gazing on the beauty of Christ, seeing his glory, his majesty, his power, his splendor, his love as, as his children, we should. But the vision is to get on the other side of that and begin to see ourselves as he sees us. That's what changes you. Do you know that's how Christ looks at you? Second, we are purchased and promised to him. We are purchased and promised him. Now, purchased, you might say, well, wait a minute, hold on, time out. Brides aren't, aren't a commodity. We don't buy them. Yeah, well, actually, that's true. Uh, but in Jesus' day, the, the bridegroom would go to the father of the bride and pay a bride price for the right to claim her, to be able to ask her to, to be his wife. Paul says in 1 Corinthians 6 that we are bought with a price. We are not our own. How do you know the value of something? We live in a culture that is desperately trying to, to help people find their sense of worth, struggling to know what we're worth, what's our value, how do we know? Can I look inside myself to find it? Can my best friend tell me? You know, do I look at my Stuart Smalley from Saturday Night Live a few generations ago? Look in the mirror, I'm good enough, I'm smart enough, I'm doggone if people like me. Right? Is that going to work? How do I know that I'm valuable? I've used this in illustration, but I love it. The, I don't even know if this show's on anymore. The Antique Road Show? Is this the little thing? Or is it? Yeah. Right. So you know how it works. People bring stuff they think might be junk or valuable, and then an expert 
Somebody who knows tells them what it's worth. And there's the, I, the best parts when the, like the amount comes across the bottom of the screen, bring, you know? And the, it's, it's cool when they think it might be junk, but it turns out to be priceless. $200,000, this, this spoon, you know, or whatever. But, but it's funny to me when it works the other way, when they think it's really valuable because their grandmother told, her, told them and it turns out it's a copy and it's junk. I just think that's funny. But that's not part of it. That doesn't help the illustration. <laughs> anyway, the, here's the question. How do you know? How does that expert on the show know what that vase is worth? Are they making it up out of, the, out of their head? How do they know? Where do they come up with a number, 50 grand, 100 grand? How do they know? It's whatever someone is willing to pay for it. They are experts because they know what, the, what people are willing to pay for that. That's how they determine the price. How do you know what your real value is as a human being? How do you know really what you're worth? Where, where, who will tell you? Jesus has told you. The price he's willing to pay for you to claim you as his bride. The ultimate price. You are literally priceless. That's how costly his love is. Think about that for a minute. The next time you're condemning yourself, judging yourself, beating yourself up, you are worth him paying the ultimate price. 1 Peter 1, verses 18 to 19 knowing that you were ransomed from the futile ways inherited from your forefathers, not with perishable things such as silver or gold, but with the precious blood of Christ, like that of a lamb without blemish or spot. So we're purchased by him. Second, we're promised to him. That was in the statement as well, promised. When I got engaged, I gave Aaron a ring. It's all I could afford at the time. I always felt sort of stuff like a tiny little diamond and a, you know, a little ring, but it was precious to her because it was a symbol of my promise. She wore it, and we, we had a limo come pick us. When we got engaged, by the way, this, people don't even, our limo's a thing, like this is dating myself. We rode around a limo so she could show off the ring to all of our friends and family. And I made, this is before you had to have an, a proposal that was like YouTube worthy. Um, we, we, I just wanted to make dinner, have her over, tell her how much I loved her, ask her. Uh, and, and so I made this Italian dinner. I, I read about how to do it make what I wanted to make, but I didn't know that you had to strain the pasta out of the water. I thought I could just leave it in the pot to let it stay warm. And it turned into like this giant mush ball of goo. So it wasn't, the dinner was terrible. Uh, maybe that's why she cried when I asked her to marry me. But anyway, <laughs> but I gave her this ring and she said yes. And we drove around to show it off. And she wore that as a symbol of my promise that, she's, that I've chosen her. She's cherished by me, pledged myself to her and her to me. And years later, I always, I went, I got, the, the stone fell out, so I took the stone and I took it to a jeweler and I made a, 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 had him design a better, a, a better version of the ring. I always wanted to do that for her. And she, she wanted her old ring back. So I had to go back to the jeweler. Can, you, can I have that crummy ring back so she, my wife could have that? Because it was hers. It was the sign of the promise. Well, we've been given a sign of his promise, Scripture tells us. An engagement ring, so to speak. That we belong to him, chosen by him. Ephesians chapter 1, verses 13 and 14. In him, you also, when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation and believed in him, were sealed with the promised Holy Spirit, who is the guarantee of our inheritance until we acquire possession of it, to the praise of his glory. When you came to trust in Jesus, respond to the offer of his love, said yes to him. You join into what we call the bride of Christ, and he gives you, he sealed you with the spirit, his spirit in you that you would know I'm his. He's chosen me. Now, I want to just show you, this, this all makes sense to us to a degree, but we don't think of marriage the same way they did in the first century Jewish culture. So I want you to see on the screen an outline here of the Jewish marriage ritual of the first century, and still to a degree today, but um, uh, in a good dates before the first century. The shidukin is the mutual commitment. This is when the bridegroom-to-be would go to the family, the father of the bride, and ask for permission. And there would be a, a price agreed upon. And it was a, a mutual commitment. They would drink a, a cup of wine. Remember when Jesus says, I will not drink this cup, this fruit of the vine, until I uh, drink it again with my father's kingdom? The, the, the father, the bridegroom, and the bride would drink this, this wine as a symbol. Uh, and they wouldn't drink that again together until the wedding day. Um, and then also then... Uh, they would both be baptized. 
independently in a mikvah, a ritual cleansing in Jewish culture, the, the symbolically cleansing themselves for their, their wedding to come. Jesus is baptized in the Jordan River. And, and John the Baptist says, this isn't right. I, I shouldn't be baptizing you. And Jesus says, it's, it's right in keeping with tradition. And we're told to be baptized as well in preparation for our, our, the marriage supper of the Lamb. And then um, erosin, this is the betrothal, what we call the engagement. This is where Mary and Joseph were this, uh, before when we read about Joseph finding out that Mary was pregnant uh, in, uh, uh, by uh, the Holy Spirit with Jesus. They're in the Eros scene. They're engaged, betrothed. This could last up to a year or longer during this time, uh, this, this, this season. They're bound to each other, considered in, by Jewish law, legally married as husband and wife, yet not living together and it's not consummated. It's kind of the already, not yet. They, they're, they're, it's not just the, the mutual commitment. They've now, they, they would be under a, a chuppah. They would have a ceremony. You'd be legally married, but you were not yet consummated. And it could take a year. We are, as a church, really in between Erosin and Nisuin. We're, we're in this betrothal. We're betrothed to Christ. We are his bride, but he has not yet come to claim us. And Nisuin was the marriage, the wedding ceremony itself. And this is when the groom would come to claim his bride. In fact, the word actually means to claim in Hebrew. And he, didn't, he did it uh, with trumpets, shofar, ram's horn, friends singing, marching through the streets, cymbals. How are we told Jesus will come back? Sneak it in the side door. Trumpets, shouts of joy. You start to see the, the, the picture of what we're given here as, as his bride. Um, and in that season between betrothal and marriage, the bride and groom had very different jobs. The groom's job was to prepare the home in which they would live together as husband and wife. And usually that meant an addition to the father's home that he grew up in because you, you didn't move off like across the country and start your own business. You were part of the family, the clan, and extending it, or maybe on his property. But the husband's job was to build and prepare and furnish and equip their home to get it all set to go, when he claims his bride and brings her home. And her job was to prepare herself to stay faithful to him, to arrange her bridal attendants, to make her and her bridal attendants gown, uh, garments of pure white, and there were lamps involved to keep their lamps prepared as a symbol of their readiness, and also uh, because, like, like, first century couples didn't send out, say, the date cards. You know why? She doesn't know when he's coming. She doesn't know when he's going to be ready. And he doesn't know how long it's going to take. He just knows when he is. What did Jesus say? No one knows the day or the hour, only the Father. And, and her job is to stay prepared. The lamps were a symbol of readiness because he might come at night to respond when he comes. So we, what's our job then? We are to be faithful to him while we wait for his return. We, the bride of Christ, are in that betrothal wedding in between. That's the church age. Faithfulness to Christ, readiness for his return. We're already his. He's purchased us. He's promised us. He's sealed us. But he hasn't yet come to claim us to be with him. Remember in John chapter 14, some of you will know the story. That Jesus says, I'm going away, and the disciples get kind of freaked out. What do you mean? Where are you going? We don't know where you're going. And he tries to explain it to them. Here's what he says in John 14, verses 1 through 3. Let not, your, let not your hearts be troubled. Believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many rooms. If it were not so, would I have told you that I go to prepare a place for you? And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and take you to myself, that where I am, you may be also. This is marriage language. I'm going to prepare. I'm getting it ready. No eye has seen, no ear has heard what the Lord has in store for those who belong to him. I'm preparing, and I'm going to come back and take you to be my own. I've purchased you with my blood. I've sealed you with the Spirit. You are mine. Now you live that way as if you belong to me between now and when I come, because I'm coming to get you. Keep your lamps ready, in other words. This is our identity. Remember Revelation 19? We read this passage, right? The, the, the Lord our God Almighty reigns, shouts of joy. For the marriage of the Lamb has come, 
and the bride has made herself ready. That's our identity. The, the perfect Lamb of God, the Lord of heaven and earth, the one who loves you perfectly and has claimed you, you're promised to him. He's coming to take us, to be here with him. Let me try just to make this more practical for us, um, that we are the bride of Christ and we're betrothed to him. This means that our hearts belong to him and we must not give our hearts or our allegiance or our deepest affections to anyone or anything else. This is incredibly poignant as we head into election season and we look out at the world and see people doing this all the time. Aligning the deepest desires of their hearts with the promise of a political party. That is cheating on Jesus, friends. You're his. You belong to him. Your heart is his. Don't give it to anyone else. We, we must, it also means that his opinion of you, of us, matters more than anyone else's opinion, including your own opinion. This has been so important for me. I don't know about you, but I've got miles of grace for you. But I'm hardest on myself. Are you like that? I beat myself up. I ought to be better than I am. And I had a friend uh, and counselor say to me recently, Jeff, why are you harder on yourself than Christ is? Can you be as kind to yourself as Jesus is to you? I can be kind to other people. In other words, if, when you realize how Jesus looks at you as his beautiful bride, why do you, you're disagreeing with him when you call yourself ugly and stupid and a failure and an idiot, if you do. I, I would not, how would it, when I got engaged to Aaron, someone talked about her that way, right? I'm, we're gonna have words. Maybe more than words, right? That's my bride you're talking about. You can't talk about her that way. We are his bride. Why do we talk about ourselves that way? It means we live with a certain hope of our bridegroom's return. It means we should get up every morning and remind ourselves, I belong to him. And today might be the day that he comes to claim me as his own. There's this parable Jesus told in Matthew 25 about the 10 virgins. It's kind of a weird parable. I've always wrestled with it. what exactly does it mean? What's the symbolism? But it's coming into focus for me now in a different way. Here's the parable, Matthew 25, verses 1 to 13. The kingdom of heaven will be like 10 virgins who took their lamps and went to meet the bridegroom. Five of them were foolish and five were wise. For when the foolish took their lamps, they took no oil with them. But the wise took flasks of oil with their lamps. As the bridegroom was delayed, they all became drowsy and slept. But at midnight, there was a cry, here is the bridegroom, come out to meet him. Then all those virgins rose and trimmed their lamps, and the foolish said to the wise, give us some of your oil, for our lamps are going out. But the wise answered, saying, since there will not be enough for us and for you, go rather to the dealers and buy for yourselves. And while they were going to buy, the bridegroom came, and those who were ready went in with him to the marriage feast, and the door was shut. Afterward, the others came, saying, Lord, Lord, open to us. But he answered, Truly, I say to you, I do not know you. Watch, therefore, for you know neither the day nor the hour. There's lots of debates about what the oil means, what the lamps mean, and what, what, what the different groups of virgins mean, and all this sort of thing. It's simpler than we try to make it. Oil in the lamp is the symbol of the Spirit of God. And keeping your lamp ready Watchfulness. Titus chapter 2, verse 11 through 14 gives us an idea of what it means to be like the wise virgins. For the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all people. It teaches us to say no to ungodliness and worldly passions and to live self-controlled, upright, godly lives in this present age while we wait for the blessed hope, the glorious appearing of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. That's what it means to be his bride. To stay faithful to him and ready for him. The, the foolish ones were really more concerned about the party than they were about the longing for the bridegroom. The, the key to understanding this is simple. It's your readiness and ability to recognize and respond to the love of Jesus for you. That's it. Can you recognize and respond to the love of Christ for you? Or are you just busy and distracted with, the, with other things? 
not that important to you. We're the bride of Christ. If we could see ourselves just for a moment, just catch a glimpse of how he sees us, it changes you. It changes you. I'm looking at myself with the wrong lenses all the time, and you are too. Lenses of judgment and of condemnation and of obligation and of guilt and of shame. No groom looks at his bride that way on their wedding day. If you're in Christ, you're covered in the blood shed for you on the cross, you're forgiven, your past is redeemed, your present makes sense, your future is secure, you belong to him. And he looks at you and he says, you're beautiful. Brothers and sisters, we are the bride of Christ. And he loves us, he delights in us, He's paid the ultimate price for us. He's claimed us as his own. He's given us his spirit to seal the promise. And he will come to get us. May we, his bride, be found faithful and ready when he comes. Revelation 22 verse 17 says, The spirit and the bride say, come. Let the one who hears say, come, Lord Jesus. Let the one who is thirsty Come, let the one who desires the water of life without price. The spirit and the bride say, come. Let's pray. Jesus, you are our bridegroom and we, uh, we are made beautiful by your love. We are not lovely in and of ourselves. We know that. But Lord, help us to see ourselves as your children, as your people, as your bride, the way you see us. You died for us. We are of infinite value to you. Help us to live that way. Live each day with the readiness, the faithfulness, the longing for your return. And between this day and that day, we give you all the praise and glory. Jesus, our great bridegroom. Amen. Like a bride waiting for her groom, we'll be a church ready for you. Brothers and sisters, may you, the bride of Christ, be found ready and waiting for your bridegroom's return. Amen, and go in peace.